Our next case is Batista versus Office of Retirement Services. This is a 15-minute mini oral argument on the application. We reserve time for rebuttal, but we ask that you keep track of your own time. You may begin when you're ready. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Robert Schindler, on behalf of Plaintiff uh, Appellants, Patricia B Batista, and six other current or former school administrators along with the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators, a representative organization that represents thousands of administrators throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, Your Honors, as you're aware, this is our second time before the court on this matter. Um, this is a, a matter re regarding state pensions and school administrators in particular. Uh, this suit was filed in the Court of Claims uh, alleging that the NSI, uh, the, the normal salary increase table that was created by ORS was contrary to law uh, and uh, constitution and many other things. Um, plaintiffs have been victorious in that regard and that the courts have, this court and the Court of Appeals have found that the NSI was in fact extra uh, legisl legislative. But a byproduct of this victory um, was a holding, a decision that um, negatively impacts thousands of school administrators throughout the state in the way that Section 3A3F of the public uh, Michigan Public Employees uh, Retirement Act is being interpreted. Um, we believe that this interpretation is contrary to the intent of the statute, and we have advocated in our briefing uh, for a, a technical read of the statute, in particular, the phrase salary schedule. Uh, and we have uh, asserted that, that the, the, the words normal salary and schedule within the statute cannot be looked at individually within a vacuum, that the phrase salary schedule has an independent meaning. Uh, in particular, this court has asked the parties to brief and to argue two specific questions, one of which is whether the phrase normal salary schedule in MCL 38.1303A3F refers only to a provision contained in a collective bargaining agreement, and two, if not, from what other source a normal salary schedule may be derived. It is the appellant's position that this phrase is in reference to a salary schedule within a collective bargaining agreement. Um, in particular, um, since 1980, when this statute was incepted, school employees, in particular teachers and support staff, have been subject to collective bargaining agreements. The PARA, the Public Employment Relations Act, came into place in 1965. Um, and School employees had been unionized and were negotiating contracts at the time the statute was enacted. Those employees were paid according to salary schedules within their contracts. School administrators, on the other hand, were not. Um, secondarily, when this statute was amended to create the current Section 3A, 3F, or 3A in particular, as a whole, Again, now we're talking 16 years later. Um, again, collective bargaining was still in place. School employees were paid under salary schedules that were negotiated as part of their contracts. School administrators were not. Um, it, it is important to understand, and one of the points that we brought up in our, in our last round of briefing is the phrase salary schedule appears only one other time in all of the Michigan compiled laws. And that's also within the school code, and in particular in section 1236 of the school code. 
1236 relates to teachers. And what 1236 sub 1 says, where it uses this phrase, is that if a substitute teacher is employed in one position for more than 60 days, then we have to pay that individual according to the current salary schedule. Now interestingly, one of the points we didn't make in our brief, but it's important to understand, is that in sub 2 of 1236, it talks about, well, what happens if a teacher, substitute teacher teaches for more than 150 days? Well, that provision goes on to say that that person gets a job, a full-time job with the school district, but only after all other teachers of the school district are reemployed in conformance with the terms of a master contract of an authorized bargaining unit and the employer. So again, the statute is presuming when it's talking about salary schedule, we're talking about people who are working under unionized contracts. As counsel, a result. I, uh, counsel, I'd love to just jump in. Um, yeah. So I, I'm trying to square your argument with our prior order. Right. Um, which I know we've sort of boxed you all in. I, I, sure. I recognize the challenge for both parties in this case. It's, it's complicated. Um, but one of the things um, we said was the Court of Appeals erred when it found subsection 3F uniquely applies only to the subset of members who work pursuant to collective bargaining agreements. Yeah. So we already said that. Well. So how do, explain to me yeah. how it is you're getting around that. Sure. So how I would square that, Justice Welch, is that what the order said and what the court seemed to focus on was the Court of Appeals language that 3A3F does not govern those who are not paid according to collective bargaining agreements. What we would say is, and what the court said was, sure, it governs all members, right? But that doesn't mean that every section within 3A are uniquely applicable to all members. In fact, the opposite is the case. If you look at everything between sub 2A all the way to 3F, all of those things only apply in certain scenarios. They aren't always applicable to all members. If a member doesn't receive merit pay, then that section doesn't apply to them. If, um, if, if, a, if, if a member isn't trying to receive a raise solely for the purpose of increasing their final average compensation, then that provision doesn't apply to them. And in the same way, 3A, 3F would govern all members but wouldn't be applicable in situations where a member isn't paid according to a normal salary schedule, which as we submit, the legislative intent on this uh, was that that related to those working under collective bargaining agreements. What do you make of um, the Alliance for School Opportunities arguments um, about how salary schedule can be defined and that it could be something that, say, the local board of education adopts? Yeah, I, I think they make good points. What I would say is, ultimately, I, we don't believe that's the, in, the intent of the legislature for a few reasons. Um, in, in particular, looking at the statute itself, the 3A3F says, Compensation in excess of an amount over the, over the level of compensation reported in the preceding year except increases provided by the normal salary schedule for the current job classification. So ultimately, there's a problem there between the idea that we're going to apply this a normal salary schedule when we're talking about the classification. Let's say, for example, you have a school district that has four assistant superintendents. And all of those assistant superintendents negotiate their own individual contracts, which is the standard course within the industry. Then how can that contract be the normal salary schedule for the job classification when there's four individuals within that job classification who have all negotiated their own individual contracts? Now, ultimately, we are asserting again that a plain language read of this provision doesn't square with the legislative intent. If the court is going to accept, however, a plain le legislative intent, we would assert that, that that option that they've laid out is maybe the best alternative. 
uh, that we would use the contracts as part of it. Uh, but our position has, is and has been that the legislative intent was that this doesn't apply to these individuals. And truthfully, in, in, until uh, uh, about 2007 or so, it never was considered to have applied to those folks. It was, there, there's nothing in the record to show, there are no cases in between 1980 and 1996 to show that this was some concern that needed to be addressed. Uh, the legislative history doesn't show that that was some concern as far as administrators that needed to be addressed in this scenario and that they were trying to address this. In fact, as we've pointed out, the legislative history shows the opposite. It shows that the debate was, we need to stop union officers. The key here being the unfunded liability that comes with somebody who is receiving a pension when they're not actually working for the school district. That was the debate. In the, in the debate, as pointed out in the legislative history, it's raised, well, hey, administrators also sometimes uh, raise their salary in different ways. And the debate clearly shows the answer was, that may be true, but this isn't to deal with that. That's for another day and another specific act, and this act isn't the one. Um, it's also important to understand that we believe the read of Section 3A3F that we're talking about here reads, makes Section 3A3E nugatory. Ultimately, all of the concerns that are being expressed by the state in this case can and should be dealt with through 3A3E, which is the provision that deals with individuals trying to raise their salary for the sole purpose of raising fi uh, final average compensation. The cases that they use as examples could have and should have easily been decided under 3A3E, instead of creating this limitation in 3A3F that, um, that will have a vast impact. In that regard, the clearest example of why a plain read of the statute doesn't work is the Court of Appeals' own decision. The Court of Appeals' own decision says that we have thousands of administrators throughout this state who receive no credit for any raise in year-to-year -year compensation increases once they become an administrator if they're in a group of, of three or more. The Court of Appeals itself calls its own decision an injustice. So the reality is a plain read of the statute does not and cannot work. Uh, and we would, would, would rely on our briefs like the Unless there's any questions, I'd like to, to save the rest of my time for a rebuttal, if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. Patrick Fitzgerald, Assistant Attorney General, on behalf of the Michigan Office of Retirement Services. With me at council table today is Solicitor General Ann Sherman. I'd like to start by walking the court through the Retirement Act's definition of pensionable compensation so as to better understand the legislative purpose underlying the so-called normal salary increase limitation. To begin, Section 3A of the Retirement Act lists types of remuneration that are excluded from the definition of compensation. I'm sorry, Section 3A of the, the Retirement Act defines what is and what is not compensation. And relevant here, Section 3A, three lists types of remuneration that are excluded from the definition of compensation, including specifically subdivision F, which excludes year-over-year -year increases in pay, accepting only those that are supported by a normal salary schedule. In other words, as both this court and the Court of Appeals have held, compensation may only be credited with respect to year-over-year -year increases if they fall within a normal salary schedule. 
This makes perfect sense as a matter of policy and is exactly what the legislature intended. The public school executives have argued emphatically that the normal salary increase limitation does not and cannot apply to them because the concept of a salary schedule is a term of art that is uniquely applicable to those who collectively bargain. To that I would say, so what? Even if a salary schedule were to be understood only as an instrument of collective bargaining, it is nevertheless the instrument that the legislature has chosen to evaluate the pensionable pay increases of this very population. So, I, frankly- Council, I, so for decades now, it's been understood that administrators do get, obviously, increases based on their salary. I understand ORS handled it differently. That got dismantled by the courts, understood. You've said normal salary schedule is not a term of art. So if I accept that as true, um, and I were to talk about um, a, 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 a pathway for wages, like somebody's gonna make X in one year, and X in another year, and X in another year. <clears throat> How is that not a salary schedule? I, I agree, I think that absolutely could be a salary schedule. Um, I, I think the key, the key is that it's a bona fide, perspective-looking salary schedule rather than an ad hoc, year-by-year, -year, uh, decided with the benefit of hindsight. Um, so yes. So could a district then, in your opinion, negotiate a superintendent contract that outlines for the next three years they're going to make X and you know X Y Z? So, so the problem, as it pertains only. Well, specifically to superintendents who, who are in one of one job classifications. Um, and I, I think that's the case across the board. So, in, in that case, uh, somebody, and let's, let's assume for the sake of argument that they were paid under a salary schedule adopted by the district or some other fashion, um, that individual wouldn't be able to use his or her salary schedule. The, the second clause of section 3A3F requires the use of a salary schedule, and I, I would argue that applies to three or more individuals. So um, that, that effectively would address the situation uh, described by the, the public school executives about districts that have three or more assistant superintendents. That's exactly a, a, a solution for them. So, but wouldn't that be an awfully strange result that districts with three or more principals in a unit, or three or more assistant superintendents, they can use a schedule, but a, a tiny rural district in the state of Michigan that has often one person running the K-6 building and maybe another 612, sometimes the superintendent's wearing multiple hats. They're just out of luck? Not at all, and, and so I, I, I absolutely disagree that there's a situation where any number of public school executives would, uh, would not be allowed credit for increases. They absolutely are, and the key here would be to use, to identify uh, a salary schedule that applies to a position that is most similar to, to the administrator. So for, for instance, uh, you would use the salary schedule applicable to principals or to other uh, business office officials or even to teachers. So there, my so it would have to vary by district. So in some places, you maybe do have one tier down that has a schedule. Principals, maybe. Uh, but another district, they don't, you only have one principal, you only got one superintendent. And hypothetical, obviously, you maybe have a business officer. So now you're to teachers. So if you're in a small district, you got to go to teachers if you're the superintendent to look to purposes of what your pension increase can be. I don't know how likely that is, but yes, to, to answer that. I mean, that, it seems pretty likely. Uh, we have a lot of small districts in this state, so I, I actually think it seems really likely. So the, the legislature, though, I think has made clear in Section 3A3F, I, I think that second clause applies exactly and, and was intended to apply to people who don't have their own salary schedules, people who uh, are exempt from collective bargaining because they're executive, supervisory level employees. And this is the, the salary schedule. I think, I think the intent here was to identify a bona fide means, something that multiple people, three or more, are paid according to. And whatever that increase is, and the, as, as I've explained now for some time, the retirement system in practice would, if we were looking at the salary schedule applicable to principals or to um, other uh, business office uh, officials, the 
uh, or, or even to teachers, we would look and say, uh, here's the salary schedule it provides for, you could look at it as a dollar figure, but I, I think it's just as fair, and this is what the retirement system has always done, has used a percentage. So that allows the comparison of apples and oranges. So if you saw uh, a, a given salary schedule provided for an increase from 50,000 to 55,000, we could extrapolate from that uh, an allowable percentage, and that's exactly what would happen. Thank you. So to be frank, I, I think it's more favorable to my position uh, to, 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 if we were to say that, uh, that a salary schedule is a term of art, that is, we are talking only about a collectively bargained schedule. What I quibble with uh, ha has more to do with I don't agree that salary schedules came into existence uh, because of or as a result of collective bargaining. I recognize in practice the vast majority of public school employees collectively bargain. That's, that is where we see salary schedules most often. But very technically, salary schedules have been, along, have been around for many, 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 many years. And so they're not a product of collective bargaining. My, my other slight disagreement is, um, so with, with a salary schedule, <clears throat> It, it doesn't have to be, like, uh, to Justice uh, Welch's point, the district could, or, or there, there are other ways to establish uh, a salary schedule. So it doesn't have to be collectively bargained. I, I, I recognize, I don't think any uh, public school executives currently work under any form or fashion of, of what they would consider to be uh, a salary schedule. Uh, they, they typically work under individually negotiated contracts, but I, I would allow for the possibility that a district, whether it's for executives or other class of personnel, it could be secretaries, it could be someone else who, who for whatever reason doesn't collectively bargain or is exempt from collective bargaining, you can have a non-collectively bargained salary schedule. So uh, to that point, um, if, if we were to agree with you and the Court of Appeals in this case, should we deny leave? I mean, it's sort of a non-question to ask the appellate. Usually we're asking the appellant, what do you want us to say in this case? But if, say that we agree with your position in the Court of Appeals, are we better to deny leave or is there benefit um, or need for us to say what we think a normal salary schedule is? Yes, well, while I would like the court to deny leave, I, I, I do concede that it would be helpful to have the court recognize that uh, not only are public school executives subject to the normal salary increase limitation, that's, that's what the statute provides, uh, but to indicate, to, to provide some clarification on uh, specifically the fact that when we're talking about a salary schedule and 99 times out of 100, if not 100 out of 100 today, we're talking about a collectively bargained salary schedule, or at least one that applies to three or more members. So, so that's, that's the operative language, and that's exactly what we would ask the court to recognize. So um, I, I'd like to, to address the argument that um, section 3A3E, um, the, the public school executives have argued here today and in the briefs that um, that the NSI provision renders it nugatory or vice versa, and, and I would I would say that it's their argument that that would be doing that. I mean, obviously, the legislature crafted these two separate provisions, and while they're complementary and perhaps partially overlapping, they do serve distinct purposes, and. What, what I would want the court to know is that the retirement system absolutely has a legitimate interest in uh, funding and, uh, and providing for only benefits that are creditable. So, and that applies in any year of a member's employment, even those that fall outside of their, uh, their so-called final average compensation or their, their pension calculation period. So whether you're uh, a 25-year-old uh, a, a new public school employee or newer public school employee, if you have a $15,000 increase, and let's, let's assume that that 
uh, falls outside of, of a normal salary schedule, it absolutely matters because, because local public school districts are paying, if that, is, if, if that increase were, were to be considered creditable, and, uh, they would have to pay retirement contributions on that amount. Um, and, and, and likewise, member contributions. So this isn't, what I'm concerned about is under 3A, 3E, that's only looking at the FAC period, we only know that once someone is retiring at the very end of their career. So uh, the, the retirement system is interested in making as near contemporaneous uh, determinations as possible as to creditable uh, or as to pensionable compensation. I, so a, a, another point that I would like to address is and I'm not quite sure where the Court of Appeals, and I, I, there was some suggestion that, uh, that the Court of Appeals decision was perceived to be unfair or that there are going to be uh, hundreds if not thousands of current public school executives who'd be deprived of uh, credit for pay increases. And, and that's, that's simply not the case. Um, what, what I have explained is the retirement system's position is that all public school executives uh, fall under the second clause of section 3A, 3F. And I, I think it's fair to understand that, that the phrase uh, less than three members, I think that's talking exactly about public school executives, people who, who, couldn't, who can't collectively bargain because they're exempt. And never, so, in other words, I don't think that the legislature intended to, uh, to look at two d different groups of, of members who collectively bargain, one being a large group, one being a small group, because uh, for starters, fewer than three usually isn't even enough to constitute a collective bargaining unit. And, and granted, I know we're talking about job classification, so, the, so it's, it, it's slightly different, but. I think in 1996, there, there weren't, the legislature was thinking of addressing and providing a mechanism to evaluate the creditable increases for people exactly like the public school executives and, and perhaps others. Um, so there, there, isn't, there isn't actually a universe where there's, there's going to be a group of people who start as an assistant superintendent or as a superintendent and then uh, will not be able to count on future increases because they will. And there's always going to be a way to identify how, whatever it is, but a bona fide salary schedule that applies to three or more members. So this is important, this three or more, it has to apply to three or more because if you, if you consider the fact that, well, what if there's one person, you know, in, in a situation that hasn't arisen yet, but there's a superintendent in the school district, they agree to pay him or her according to a so-called salary schedule. Um, and, and that may be derived from, you know, a series of contracts or otherwise. There again, because that member can't use can't, you know, wouldn't fall, wouldn't be allowed to use that salary schedule, nor should other people be allowed to use his or her so-called one-of-one schedule to justify their increases. So. Council, before you, you sit down, um, I just want, I'm glad you brought up subsection E. Um, so that specifically, obviously, says compensation does not include remuner remuneration paid for the specific purpose of increasing the final average comp. I mean, is there any group except for really superintendents that could apply to? If you have a traditional collective bargaining schedule, you can't just kind of throw money in there for purposes of increasing pensions. You're much more locked in. So it does seem like at least people subject to personal employment contracts would be who that's aimed at. I, I, I would agree that, that public school executives would be a prime example, but I wouldn't rule out that it could happen in collective bargain agreements. For example, by having clauses that provide for uh, uh, an abnormally large increase in, say, the 30th year of employment or the year of employment when somebody reaches pension eligibility. A, a clause like that, I think, would offend um, 
would offend the general anti-pension spiking provision. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, just a few brief responses. First, in terms of the language of 3A, 3F, and this idea that um, without that, there are no increases. What we would say is that 3A, 3F is not very well drafted. Uh, it is drafted in a passive voice. Um, and as a result, the intent of it, though, is that it's talking about compensation increases beyond a normal salary schedule meaning applying to those paid under a normal salary schedule and only that. To Justice Kavanaugh's question, we believe that if leave was simply denied, it would be disastrous um, for a few different reasons. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald stated that, that it would simply not be the case that there are people who wouldn't receive year-over-year -year compensations and that there's not a universe in which that occurs. But the Court of Appeals said exactly that. In essence, what ORS is saying is, it won't happen because trust us, we wouldn't do that. Well, pardon me, but I don't trust them. Because the history shows that their job or what they try to do is hold down compensation, even if it's properly negotiated with employers. And so uh, there is a universe where that happens and in fact, many of them, about 800 plus school districts where it could possibly happen. So let me, let me ask you, you say de denying leave would be disastrous. If we don't agree with your position, yeah. are, you, are you still advocating that we, say we affirm the Court of Appeals, is there, is there value to us defining what a normal schedule is, even if it's not your position? Well, I we would, we would say, Justice, that... It's a there, weird position to put you in. Though. It is. Yeah. And, and, and the reality is that in any way that the Court of Appeals decision, in particular, uh, as to this read is upheld, uh, is going to be hard on public education. It is going to harm public education greatly because we have one of two scenarios for public school administrators. We have one scenario where they're in a group of three or more and they don't get year over year compensation, which is what the, the, the statute or what the court has said. The other group is a group of less than three. I'm sorry, my time is out, but I oh, yeah. finished. Okay, thank yeah. you. The other group is a group of less than three who aren't paid under normal salary schedules. Um, and we, that, we now have to figure out how to, uh, how to deal with them. Mr. Fitzgerald has said we have to compare them to a group of three or more, which, by the way, is also extra statute. There's not, nothing in the statute that would say it has to be three or more. Um, that we have to pay them three or more, and we have to compare them to maybe some other bargaining group within the school district. Well, that doesn't make sense with the statute either, because the statute talks about amount of compensation. So we can't look at the amount of compensation for a superintendent and compare it to the teachers because they're naturally going to make more money in amount. By doing the indexing on a percentage basis, that wouldn't be consistent with the statute either. So potentially we can compare them to other administrators, other superintendents, and maybe under the statutory scheme we could create a situation where um, they have to present contracts of other superintendents from like districts to show that their level of compensation is in line with those. But now we're creating this whole scheme in order to apply the statute that doesn't exist within the statute and that there's no evidence that the statute actually was trying to get to uh, to create this result. It sounds and, to me like you want, I mean, like that's, that your, your remedy is with the legislature. If that's the way it's supposed to work as opposed to us saying what we think. No, we, it means. Well, we disagree. I, we believe the remedy is for this court to understand that the language should be applied the same way it was for 20-some years until Mr. O'Brien, who is the example that they give in their case, spiked his pension or spiked his, his, his pay right before he retired. And 
the ORS had to create a square peg to fit into their round hole, which was figuring out a way to limit this without having to do the work of all the comparison. And that's what they did when they created the NSI. They took a provision of the statute that doesn't apply, and they applied it anyway, instead of just saying 3A, 3E would take care of this. And that's what they should have done. And I am out of time, so unless there's anything else, thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you both. The case will be submitted, and the court will stand at recess until 1 o'clock.